The Cubs are honored to have Drew Robinson here today to throw out a ceremonial first pitch. I never would have thought getting into this that I would have healed so much just by sharing my story openly. I thought I was initially doing it just to help other people, but I didn't realize how much it was going to help myself too, and I think that's a lesson that we can all kind of hold on to. Drew, it's great to meet pleasure you, to meet you. It's great to meet you too. Um, we're survivors in a different sense. Um, my dear daughter passed from suicide f almost four years ago. I could not be here with you a year ago, two years ago, maybe even a year ago, because it was that difficult. But we find ways to rise above that and find ways to carry on. And, and because your story is pretty phenomenal, and I, I've seen a lot of interviews, uh, read your story on the ESPN website, and, and uh, we've done a lot of heavy lifting in terms of trying to, where you've been, where you're trying to go. And so I just kind of want to get a sense of how that's going with you and how, how you're proceeding, how you're moving forward with your life and, and the resources that you're falling back on. Well, I appreciate that. It really means a lot. It's, it's powerful stuff to talk about. And it's been a pretty crazy, I don't even know I'm now, like 17 months, 18 months now. Um, but I'm really honored and grateful to still be here, just talking about things openly, as vulnerable as I possibly can to try to let people feel comfortable and realize there's a lot of help out there. There's a lot of strength in, in talking about some of your messes and, and it's something that I really want to share with people. Mm -hmm. I know st stigma is a huge, you know, a huge barrier and kind of trying to get through those stigmas. And uh, you mentioned how being vulnerable and not being afraid to talk to people. I'm afraid the, the flip side of that is that too often, and right, it was that the case with you, you didn't, when. You know, prior to April of last year, you didn't really want to do that. Yeah, hundred percent. I, I was struggling big time, but I was able to function pretty normally. I had normal goals. I worked really hard. I had a supportive family. So, from the outside, who was going to understand that I was feeling the way I was feeling? I did open up a little bit. I, I knew I was struggling, so I did reach out for help in a, in a sense. But I didn't necessarily ask for help. I was seeing a therapist, and I was still holding a lot of things back. My thoughts didn't get as severe until a couple months before it happened. I've always kind of battled some depression, some social anxiety and some performance anxiety, but it was just crazy how fast it all happened when I look back um, and how extreme things got in a short period of time. So that's why the importance of just letting it all out when you can and, and finding someone you trust and, and, and taking advantage of someone that you, that you believe in that can help you just kind of organize the thoughts that, get in, that kind of get a little uh, misorganized in your head. I want to know a little bit more about your story if you're comfortable talking about it. Yeah, thank you. Um, I have a wife and um, two daughters. Um, well, I like to say I still have two daughters. Um, my oldest daughter lives in um, Oregon, Bridget, and Megan's my youngest daughter. She, she lives here. <laughs> and uh, I think there's a lot of similarities between you and her. You can see the, the joy and the happiness that she projected. She saw therapists and she went through issues. I mean, went through things like that, processes. But I, I think, as you noted yourself, that I don't think she was transparent enough. She also uh, suffered from some bullying and, uh, and d domestic abuse, the latter of which we were not even aware of, we found out after the fact. She never went to go see a doctor, never reported it to a police officer. So I think it's because of those stigmas, because of not, not, not wanting to worry her, her parents or or other loved ones, or best, even her best friends, because nobody saw this coming. Here we are outside Wrigley Field. This is one of Megan's favorite places to go. We were at uh, games four and five of the World Series, and she told me what a great time she had. I mean, it's, it's, and then less than a year later, she was, she was gone. But I keep trying to move forward, keep trying to sort things out, and, and part and parcel of that is trying to help others to move their lives forward. There's resources and there's avenues, people, pathways people can go down so that they don't have to go there. In people's lives, sometimes it takes such tragic things to make them realize 
certain things that, that we may take for granted, myself included. But that's the message I want, I want to kind of spread to everybody is like, just having a good day can build momentum to have a good week, good month. Eventually you have, you stack years on top of it and you're just riding this wave of positivity and just embracing how beautiful life is. And that's, like I said, something I took for granted because I just got so caught up in in my, my own struggles. I used to try to justify things and talk about things inside my head all the time, but I would just get so lost in my own thoughts that I, I just felt so hopeless and so helpless. I'm learning now that when I say these things out loud and talk to someone that I trust or I believe in, I hear what I'm saying and sometimes they're not so, they're not as true as they feel as inside of me. So hopefully just talking about it out loud and openly make people realize that don't have to go down that road to get to this point. Exactly, I, I think one of the stigmas or one of the uh, m misunderstandings is that the attitude still is that some people still think that, that trying to take one's own life is, is a selfish act, but it's not. I mean, it, anyone who knows Megan knows she's extraordinary, an unselfish person. And even in her notes to us, she mentioned some extraordinary gratitude she had too, how much she loved us. And I think people need to understand that too. It wasn't, you were not being selfish, you were lost. And I'm sure you were thinking about your loved ones, but it's mostly though, you're thinking about how am I gonna escape this? Is that kind of where you were at the time? I think I might've even said that at some point in my life that I viewed suicide as selfish. Um, but I was such a people pleaser and, and tried to put people first so often that I just completely disregarded my own feelings at times and just com and put myself on the back burner and never helped my own self at times. So that's uh, exactly how Megan was. She always I put other people it's first, right? The type of thing where I I was just I was sick. I, I was mentally just lost, like we've talked about and I was so caught up in little tiny mistakes or just doing something a little off and how that would affect other people. That's that's what I would fixate on nonstop. So now I'm just trying to find that balance of also taking care of myself while being able to serve others. The correlation between selfishness and, and suicide just doesn't really mix, doesn't make any sense in my head anymore. It's like I keep saying, it's important that you don't have to go through what I went through to learn these things and understand and find that empathy for people that are exactly. having these thoughts and having these battles within. It's an extraordinary just, dark place. I mean, and so I had my own suicide ideation after losing Megan, so I kind of know the dark hole that can be. and. And you mentioned um, you mentioned a few times here. You mentioned empathy, and I think you know even in her, her notes to us because she said continue to feel empathy for others and surround yourself with loved ones. Even as she was going to end her own life, she was thinking, kind of trying to give people instructions on how to try and live their lives. Which is, I mean, it's this it's profound, and it gets 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 us right here still to this day, obviously. But I mean, who who would do that if they're selfish? Right. Yeah. That hits home with me because that's. That's exactly what I was doing. I, I pulled the trigger and I was in my house for 20 hours after, until I called 911. Um, but in those 20 hours, I was doing a lot of things to try to make it easier for my family. Um, I was trying to clean things up. I was trying to make it easier. The note that I wrote, I think I even wrote like, I know this doesn't justify, but I just want to make it as easy as possible for people to understand what, the way I was feeling. And it's kind of weird to think about because like, how can, how could that be associated with the word easy at all. So like, like I said, that's why it doesn't justify the way I was describing things, doesn't justify what I was, was eventually about to do. But um, it just hit home with me because I feel a very strong sense of empathy for you and your, and your daughter. It's because uh, I know exactly what she was going through and it's, it's tough. I felt like no one else knew exactly what I was feeling, but to hear other people are feeling that way always gets me because I know how bad that feels. Yeah, I, and I know you've done, like I mentioned at the outset, I know you've done a lot of heavy lifting. I've watched your interviews, and again, I'm so intrigued by your, you know, the second act. I mean, that's kind of like where you're at. It sounds like some really positive things are coming from that. I mean, in terms of your recovery, your healing, trying to move forward. I'm curious, how are your, you know, the loved ones in your life, how, how do they feel about your second act? Do they feel a sense of, I don't know, uh, rebirth themselves because they, they, you're, you're still here, even as, yeah. as difficult as it was to go through that. I think, I think so. I think it's something that's been really cool because it's just like every other obstacle, you learn from it and it's brought up my family and my friends and I much closer. Just like everything else in our life, we're just trying to make the best of, of, of things. So it's tough for them. I know at certain points it's hard for Diana to be in, in the same area that it happened in, in, in our house and then 
Um, it's every once in a while when I maybe don't respond right away to my mom or dad or whatever, it might cause like a little extra worry just because of the circumstances. But I've gotten to know my family, my friends more in these last 17, 18 months than I did for the 28 years prior to my incident. I think that's where I'm excited for this next part of my life because I want to share that support and I want to share those resources and let people realize they have support probably a lot closer to them than they realize. So um, shining that light on these things and letting people feel that comfort of being related to, um, being understood and that they're not alone is like just so powerful. And that's something that we're all kind of learning as a group right now. Right. Um, obviously the Cubs are recognizing this day as well. I, I just want to know how the, how the Giants, how supportive they've been. Yeah, it's pretty remarkable how, how backed I feel by the Giants and it's just, so amazing to me the way that they are just so open to addressing this with me and and allowing me to share this message and support it at the same time it just shows that they care about me as a person first and now being in this role as a mental health advocate working directly with our mental health and mental skills team it just shows how much they believe in them in the message and how how important it is to them it's so genuine and it's it's something that they didn't have to do all the phone calls and messages and things I got last year during my, my physical recovery, um, that didn't need to happen. They didn't need to take the time while they were trying to run an organization. It's such a beautiful thing to, to be a part of such a strong family. And I'm lucky enough to be able to experience that with my immediate family, my friends, and now the Giants. I'm so grateful for it. It's, it's such a cool thing. And now being here on Suicide Awareness Day and actually talking about these things out loud, openly in front of an audience, um, Again, it just shows how much people are starting to believe in these things and realize how important it is to talk about and how important it is to address because it's literally life or death. Exactly, exactly. There is life for all of us, regardless of our circumstances. And there's reasons to keep trying to move forward. In the, in the immediate aftermath, there were for months, even a few years probably, I, I used to check myself. I, when I was joyful or happy about something, I, would, I felt guilty. How can I do that? How can I think that way? My, my, my dearest youngest daughter is not here anymore. Over time, I've worked to get away from that. And you need to have that great support. There's been some extraordinary people, and I like to think of the, as, as a glass being half full. You know, there'll be, there will be folks, obviously, you know, I mean, because this thing is not ending overnight, but there will be, there will be others. Uh, who will be like my daughter, who will pass, and there will be, there will be the carnage from that. And, and so for those folks, um, you, you've got to keep striving no matter what. I mean, it's, gonna, it's horrific, but you've got to keep pushing it. You've got to keep finding ways to find happiness where you can, find joy where you can. Yeah. It's the beauty and simplicity of life. Like I said, I, sometimes I get so caught up in things just being so grand and so exciting that kind of take for granted the simple things about just having a good morning, having a good lunch with a friend or whatever maybe. In my case, because I played baseball, I got to experience very high highs of adrenaline rushes and external validation things that when I did something as simple as just have a good morning or listen to a good song, I didn't even think twice about it. Um, and that's what I mean by kind of just really buying into the simple joys in life and like I said, creating the momentum of a good morning, a good afternoon, a good day, before you know it, you're having a good week and a good month. And when things necessarily don't go that way, understanding that they're not gonna last forever. And you never know, the next minute could be the turning point and it's right around the corner, the good is right around the corner at all times. Again, I want a lot of people to know that if you are struggling, you're, you will not be misunderstood. There's plenty of people that if you talk to, they might even share with you, hey, I've even, I've even felt that way at times and you would be surprised and that's something that I'm learning. If I would have just opened up a little bit more in the beginning, I think I would have been really surprised at how many people have either, either thought about certain similar things or felt similar ways. But at the end, I was a lot more relatable to people than I realized. And that's where I'm finding now in this, this movement of vulnerability. That's where, I'm, that's where I'm finding all my strength nowadays. I think it's great that and you're finding, like you mentioned, you find the resources are there. And then here we are raising this awareness that Cubs are raising this great awareness. And, and I'm, you know, other baseball teams are doing this as well. I hope maybe one day all Major League Baseball will do something where we reflect on mental health awareness, suicide prevention. And the more awareness, the more, the more we can raise attention here, the more we're going to help others. And that's what this needs to be all about.